Not going to give up. I'm going to find a vegetable that they are going to own, okay? All right. Whew. All right, so let's, let's do this. Um, this has been an um, a interesting, interesting week in a lot of ways. Um, let me start out by, by saying this. Um, this morning as I, as I walked into the, to the fellowship hall, um, I, didn't, I didn't sleep. Good last night. Saturdays are usually the nights where I really don't sleep well anyway because I'm already going, where am I supposed to be? And all, that, all that stuff kind of rolls my head. So I don't sleep well on Saturday. But last night was just like worse. Okay, so I just came in here kind of already groggy and stuff. And, and, and Jimmy Locklear looked at me and said, You need something to wake you up, don't you, boy? I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> He said, come here, I'm going to pour you a cup of coffee. And it wasn't just any coffee. It, he said, it's going to be like tar. He said, he said this is going to wake you up. So I got that blessing. And then as, as Alex Ivins is walking, he's holding two cups of coffee. And, and for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit told him that Brian needed some more coffee. So I love the way that God works in, in y'all through this. Um, but here, here's the theology in some of this. Um, I'm going to begin this message and... Um, by trying to, to, to wake you up with some of Jimmy Locklear's coffee. I'm going to say something. I don't want it to kind of let it sit and see if it wakes you up, okay? And, and let it sit for a while before you start stoning me. So I'm going to go ahead and preface it that way, okay? Here, here it is, and I hope we're going to be able to connect it with, with, with James and with this hymn together. But I do not want you, I don't think that Jesus wants you to strive to be a good Christian. I don't even think Jesus wants you to be a great Christian. I love those looks. Okay, good. And your wheels should be turning when I say something like that. Because here's what I think. I believe that we sometimes just strive for good. How are we doing today? I'm having a good day. I'm having a great day. I'm having an exceptional day. We use those words, but again, if we talked about this, those are, those are emotions. Good can be changed just like that. I can have something that was having a good day. Now my day has been completely wrecked. But I believe this as we think about how Jesus came into this world. We talked about last week all these different covenants. God said, I'm making a covenant with so many different people all along the spectrum of, of the seasons. The seasons where the Israelites and folks followed God very well and those where they just kind of went off in their own directions. And remember from last week, Jeremiah was placed in his culture to say, I'm going to be a bearer of bad news to you. But the bad news is that you haven't been following God and you continue to take the bar and lower it and lower it and lower. And what God is always wanting, I'm going to give you the punchline here and the, the reason I'm put, framing it this way, that, that God desires us to strive for covenantal relationships, first of all with Him, and then second of all with each other. And when we begin to have the, the covenantal relationships and they're stronger and deeper and wider, you know what begins to happen? All, all of that fruit now begins to be born through the, through the deeds, through the actions, through the ways that we just go about living. And I don't want us to start and just go, you know what, my goal is just to, just to be good. Think about when, when Jesus got Nicodemus there one-on-one. -on -one. Nicodemus is going, man, I need to find out what this Jesus guy is all about. And Jesus didn't go, Nicodemus, this whole thing about the kingdom of God, if you are a good Pharisee, you will see the kingdom of God. Did he say that? No. He said, if you really want to understand what the kingdom of God is like, he said, you know what? You're going to be born again. What? It's about a radical transformation of going, this is, this is why I've come. Jesus, early in his ministry, is setting the bar going, this is not about making you good. This is about getting you back to this covenantal relationship with God so that you can be in covenant now with each other. And I just think that we, and I, I, boy, I'm, I'm guilty of this. This really has spoken my soul this week. I settled for good so many times. I settled for great so many times. And thinking, man. 
But I think what I'm also finding out when when I just settle for that, it's, it's again that, that emptiness that comes from just not really wanting to be challenged to go deeper knowing more about this God that wants to be in this beautiful covenantal relationship with me and with you. So as we think about where, I'm sorry, when the church of Jesus and how this hymn is written directly from um, the second chapter of James that we're going to talk about. I want us to be challenged with, um, with how we really define our role as the church, how we're a part of that, individually, corporately. You know, as I had the children look there at those seeds and, and, and just look at all that together, there, there's so much about how God is saying, um, again, I, I set you apart for this time and for this place and for this season. I've given you this resource of, of, of my grace, always fulfill it, always going ahead of you, um, and asking us to, to, to continue to, to raise the bar, continue to really strive and to hunger and thirst for this God that we can easily just go, Jesus, I'm, 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 I'm one of yours. But as James talks about faith and deeds, I think, again, it's just another one of those places where we can, we, can, we can easily justify with God, well, God, you saw me at church today. You saw me, the preacher saw me, so I am good for today. I, I, I let that person in front of me at, the, at, the, at Ingalls because they had one thing and I had a basket full, so I've done a good deed. I'm not telling you not to do those things. Don't hear me wrongly. But when we look at it, with that is our goal in that, you know what we're going to achieve? That's what we're going to achieve. And I don't believe that any of us beautifully created in the image of God has just been made just to do good things. As important as good things are. So where does faith and deeds line up here? Let's unpack this some. Stand with me, please. Second chapter of James, verses 14 through 17. Yes, that's what we want to read this morning. 14 through 17 says this. James says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister was out clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you. Hopefully now you know me well enough that I just don't take verse of scripture and, and throw out that bomb and go Poof, and go all right go figure it out and that, that's the danger of, of taking again a portion of this entire letter and going all right what'd you hear in that i think it's gonna be very important for us to connect the dots to, to go back and let's get into the let's get in the mind of james very quickly let's in I am, as I'm getting older, I'm seeing how I really psychoanalyze things more than I did before. Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing sometimes. I'd say, Brian, stop. But as we psychoanalyze James here for a second, um, th this first chapter, as he begins just now to write, again, first century, this, is, this Jesus person has come into the scene and has rocked the world in so many ways. And it's challenged people to think about life. Think about all the ways that they were doing what they're doing. And as it has motivated these, these authors of, the, of the, the New Testament now, they come from different angles. But I think, again, if we begin to just read between the lines, they're all really expressing now their, their, their more mature look at how they're, 
they're, they're learning about this new covenant. You know, as, as, we, as we take Holy Communion together and we really go back to that time where Jesus and His, his disciples were in that last moment, and as Jesus is talking about these symbolic things, He's saying, do all things in, in remembrance of Me. It's this beautiful way of this, this new covenant that I'm making with you. Jesus did not miss an opportunity to, to live out covenantial language. And as humans, we, we just miss all that sometimes because we're, we're, we're trying to kind of figure out this journey like a, like a puzzle. And it's not the way that God would have us to do so. But James begins to, um, to write this, and I think it's important, it begins just to say to the 12 tribes that were scattered. Again, think about the way that Jesus left the earth saying, you know what, you're going to be my witnesses in all these places. He didn't say you're just going to stay in Jerusalem. He began to get that, that whole ripple effect, the way that I think God is calling me to unpack wider. It's about getting to that, that next place. And not just the next place as a destination, but a, but a way that this Jesus influence is just going across um, all places, all places and to, and to all people. And what is happening is all of these places are getting scattered, and and the the gospel of Jesus is going around. Um, there has, and I think that's fair to say, as, as we just look at the universal worldwide church today, so many different ways. Um, that, that we have taken and go, and this is what Christianity is all about. And then when we find an expression that we go, hmm, I kind of line up with that, you know, th here's the reason for denominations. And I'm not, I'm not bashing denominations, but as we just look at the way that we have been scattered and the way that we continue to scatter, it, it's, it's among some of these ways that, that we understand this Jesus and how we want to live this thing out. Okay? But within all of this that James is, is trying to get to, the, um, get to the heart of things, he begins to unpack these folks are being, um, they're being tested. They're having trials. They're having all these things that are, that are challenging the way that they see Jesus. And just like first century, we have those moments, again, where we just settle for something because our, our circumstance, our situations, our whatever, as you fill in the blank, is the voice that's screaming loudest, that is, that is getting our attention, and we're just finally getting to the point and going, okay, this is all of this growth in Jesus that I, A, want to endure, or I feel like that I'm going to endure. There, there's a ceiling there, and that's a human thing. That's not a God thing. Paul would address the Galatians by going, you know what, you took this gospel that I gave you, and now you've turned it into something that's no gospel at all. So, so there were so many ways of them really understanding about how this new covenant with Jesus was now supposed to be lived out. As a Jew, you look in there and go, how does that Gentile Steve Barber get the same grace that I do? I, it, it, just, it just blows my mind. How, how can I live that out? And as we do that today, we may not point fingers at Jews and Gentiles, but we begin to think about what God is doing in and through us and look at somebody else and go, Wait a minute, this is not this is not making sense. So as James uses that word perseverance, so that we can be mature and complete, he talks about asking God for wisdom. And I would think if there's anything that, that God, not only in this place, but in different places, begins just to say, ask me for that. Do you, do you really want wisdom? Do you really want to, to understand who I am at a, at a deeper level? James says, it'll, it'll be given to you, but be prepared. There's accountability and responsibility when we really ask God for things like wisdom. Goodness gracious. Because if you have read the, the, the book of James before, it's, it's not an easy one to read. James, James is very much, I'm, I'm going to, be in your face. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but I'm going to begin to explain the, the importance of this covenantial relationship with God. So as we now interact with one another, we have not just had the bar here and just settled for something. 
some, some kind of Christianity that's really no Christianity at all. See, I'm going to stretch you and, and I'm going to challenge you. But I'm also going to tell you this with that love and that grace that we talk about that, that Christ is full of. It's a, it's a spiritual healthy tension that we always can embrace. And James is one of those that will make you kind of go, oh man, he's talking to me. And then many times I've read it and go, man, I'm going to walk away from reading this feeling guilty and, and shameful and, and down on myself. And that, that's not the way the Spirit of God works in us. As we're convicted to, to, to raise the bar, God's just saying, come, come back to the covenant. Come back to this relationship and let's heal and grow together. And that's the, the overall theme of James' letter is he's talking about just some specific things that are going on in his culture. But as we think about then, as we get to, to what our passage is talking about today, about this whole concept of faith and deeds, the one last verse that I want to lead in to this discussion um, is at the end of James. And it's one that I've, I've highlighted in my Bible, and I've, I've done that a long time ago, but it's a place that, that continues just to speak to me. Um, James says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. So he begins to now unpack what this whole covenantal relationship, what, is, what does it look like? What does it look like? James says, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. I don't know about you, as I, as I look around our world today, I see many Jesus opportunities within that definition. And boy, take the broader definition of widows and orphans. That to me is, is not just to put this in a box, nice and neat. And to be polluted from the world, oh my goodness, we could spend a lot of time on that, couldn't we? Hello? We could spend a lot of time on that, couldn't we? Okay, good. I was hoping maybe. All right. Yes, that is something that is right in front of us day in and day. I don't care where God has planted you. So if, if we're really going to, to, to live out what this covenant with God looks like, I would say that's not the, the exhausted way and the exhausted definition. But what that definition does for me, it begins to force me to think about what I know about God and now what God is calling me towards in this time and in this season in the way that he's gone. Brian, I've set you apart. I'm, I'm asking you to be faithful exactly where I planted you. And the broader definition with us now is, okay, how does this whole thing with faith and deeds really line up? Because we look around and I look at, at, at y'all's faces and I, and I know the things that, that y'all are being a part of and, and the way that you're, you're seeking the heart of God with each other. Um, th th those things are colliding. Those things are colliding. But in James' time and like ours, there, there, there's many, um, many ways that it, it just doesn't meet the, um, the, the road properly. It doesn't fit the calling properly. And I'll say, as we take a, a broader um, and, and deeper look with that, I think we need to go back to the way that um, the way that John Wesley, who started this whole this this whole movement that we're part of called Methodism, uh, approached at this covenantal relationship. Again, in a time in his season, man, um, it'd have been easy for us to look at him and go, you know what, John. You've got all the things um, to just say you, you are in a, in a good place with where God has placed you and a good place with who you are in Christ. He had a, he had a beautiful platform. He, he, was a, he was a preacher's kid who was called from the very beginning to, 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 to be a minister to the world. He had all the resources. He had all the education. It had been easy for John just to say, you know what, I'm good with all those things. But if you take a deeper struggle with why we have this Methodist movement, Wesley would say, 
I don't think the bar has been raised high enough. I don't think that, that we have enough of faith and work really coming together to, to show the world um, wh what this journey is all about. And it took a lot of struggle and it took a lot of pain. And there were times when he said, you know what, God? You know, is, is this really what you're, you're calling and asking me to do? So many times as he tried to bring um, Methodism over here, it was just like... <sighs> But he trusted God fully with what was going on. And he trusted God fully with knowing that he wasn't the only one called to make a difference in the world. And he knew that his platform, the, the gifts that he'd been given, the, the different ways that he just woke up and said, okay God, today is really a new day for your mercies to be new, for your grace to be present. Where are we going? Where are we going? And I don't know, as I look around and, and, and see the different expressions of, of people that profess and go, well, you know what, I'm active in this church and all these different things, um, I begin to want to see how all of those words begin to live out the godly purpose that is in their lives. Part of my role is how do I, how do I help lead you and guide you with these things that God has placed in my heart to be able to help us all Grow up in, in this grace with Jesus. But I think it is very easy, and, and I catch it in my own life, to just allow whatever is going on to be able to dictate who we are in Christ instead of it being the other way around. Way too many times we're reactive and we're not proactive. Give you the example, and then I want to I want to bring the the hymn in here. As I was, and I forgot what night it was. It was it was Thursday or Friday. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV. Um, I landed on I landed on Food Network, um, and I don't know how long this show's been called out, but it's, it's called um, Re Restaurant Possible. Anybody seen that? Okay. This this brilliant guy goes in and says, "I'm going to take." 48 hours and, and take your messed up restaurant and I'm going to turn it into something that now has purpose. And, and this one was just, okay, man, I said, man, there's theology all over this episode. So my brain is going all over this with this. But, but this, real quick, this, this restaurant in Chicago um, is right in the middle of all of these people, all of these, these, uh, these, these condominiums and where, man, there's just a lot of people in a concentrated area. And, and y'all, it's a lot colder in Chicago right now than it is here, okay? And they filmed this in the winter, and there's snow all over the ground. And, you know, so they got this neat little market. They've got this place where you can come in and, and get, you know, sandwich meat, but you can also get, you know, a gallon of milk. And you can also come in here and sit down and eat the restaurant. So they got this one-stop place to take care of their neighborhood's needs. Okay, follow with me, their neighborhood's needs. And they couldn't figure out going, we got all these people around us. Why, why aren't people coming? Well... The, th the three owners in this, one dealt with produce, one dealt with marketing, and one dealt with the, with the culinary stuff. They all decided that they knew what their customers wanted. They had decided that they're going to have a $12 gallon of milk down in their restaurant. They all decided that that, that jar of mayonnaise needed to be the, the top brand premium stuff, and they had all these aspirations of, of how this was supposed to be this big old top end thing, and the customer's like, I want a gallon of milk for $1.98. Sorry. It, it, it's, it's 20 below zero right now, and you're in my building. I want to come down and get that dozen eggs and, and leave. But they weren't. They were going somewhere else because they didn't take the time to know what their people actually wanted. And I wonder sometimes as Christians that we go, you know what? I think think this is what the people that God has placed in my life, this is what they want. Without really unpacking what it means to allow faith and then our, our outward actions to really dictate what it means to be in a deep covenantal relationship with God so we can have a deep covenantal relationship with one another. And I'm afraid if the church is not careful, the universal church, we're going to really be 
less relevant than what we are now to the world. God is calling us back into saying, get to really know me so that you can love on my world. So on 592, I think for a lot of those reasons, as I did a little more research on this hymn that I never heard of, um, really speak to what's going on. When the church of Jesus, not if or maybe, but when the church of Jesus, listen, when the church of Jesus shuts its outer door, lest the roar of traffic drown the voice of prayer, may our prayers, Lord, make us, listen, ten times more aware that we would vanish as our Christian care. If our hearts are lifted where devotion soars high above this hungry, suffering world of ours, lest our hymns should drug us to forget its needs towards our Christian worship into Christian deeds. Lest the gifts we offer, money, talent, time, serve to salve our conscience to our secret shame. Lord, reprove, inspire us by the way you give. Teach us, dying Savior, how true Christians live. Y'all pray with me. Jesus, we love you. And we thank you. God, forgive us all for, for sometimes, maybe many times, just settling with good. Just settling with great. Just having us dictate um, what, what this relationship with you is all about. God, God in your kingdom, there, there are no ceilings. Grace is filling us continually to go be the hands and feet of Jesus. There isn't a place where we get too much of your love and say, God, that's enough. You're continuing, God, to ask us to to get closer to You, to really understand what this covenant relationship is all about so that we may truly express to this dying and hurtful and sinful and broken world the God that we're an active part of, how we connect all the dots according to You. So again, God, as a church, You have set us apart and You have called us and You've asked us in this day just to be Jesus. So if we're going to be Jesus, then we need to spend time with Jesus in order to teach others what this life of Jesus is all about. So God, get our hunger and thirst back. Have us really hungry and thirsty for what you want us to hunger and thirst about. We know the resources are there. God, you just ask us to take that one step closer to you in this day. We love you. We give you thanks always. Make our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. Fountain where I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom from my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh. The king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good. Oh.
All right. Let's do some some share.